Well, I have good news and I have bad news. Just wanted you to know that. <laughs> the good news is uh, next Sunday, which will be Mother's Day, we're going to have a drive-in church, so I hope you can come to that. And I haven't talked to the young men yet, but I'm going to need some parking attendance because I know how Baptists park. And we're going to have to have some structure in order to get everybody here, I hope. But uh, we visited a lot of folks this week, and uh, I think every one of them said that they would like to be here. So we're going to try to do our very best to accommodate them. I have no, no idea how many will come, but that's what we're going to do. And I think Sunday, to, uh, which will be tomorrow, uh, for those of you watching, this is not live, but uh, the best we can do, uh, but Sunday starts phase one of our governor's plan to open the state back up. And we're going to, as far as I know, we're going to continue to meet drive-in until we can actually come inside and do that the way we used to do. I know everything, uh, things are not going to be the same, but we'll do the best we can with what we have. And... Uh, I think it will be a whole lot more enjoyable than watching it on a TV screen or a, or something along that line. But let's take our Bible and turn to Mark chapter 3. We're going to consider verses 1 to 6 where Jesus goes back into the synagogue and there is a problem. And we'll talk about that. So Jesus heals on the Sabbath again. This is not the first time. So in the past few weeks, we've seen Jesus do some amazing things. Let's read this passage, and we're going to see something else that he does that's amazing. So beginning with verse 1 of Mark chapter 3. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, now this is the scribes and the Pharisees, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out, and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So you can see that good things don't always happen in the house of God. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you to bless the time we have. And I pray, Father, as this passage, as we're confronted with it, that we will, I pray, make some changes in all of our lives as to what we do on the Sabbath day. Thank you for this passage. Help us to understand it. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus has shown the people who he really is in the last few weeks. He's healed the man with leprosy. That's never done. He healed a man with an acute case of paralysis. They let him down through the roof, if you remember that story. And he cast out demons. And of course... He defended his disciples just last week, and now we come to him healing a man with a withered hand. Now, this must have been some kind of accident that happened to this fellow because the original language gives us the idea that he was not born this way. So we see that Jesus cares not for the attitude of the religious leaders and how he observes the Sabbath. Because you see, in their mind, only a life-threatening illness could be treated on the Sabbath. No Orthodox Jew would defend themselves against a life-threatening act on the Sabbath. I don't think we understand that. That's how legalistic they were with this understanding. As a matter of fact, if a woman was in labor, she could be attended to. But if a person cut themselves, 
The cut could be bandaged, but no ointment applied. Now, after the Sabbath, you could take care of it. Now, that's legalism. That's taking something that God intended to be a holy day and putting too much on it. It's like that little game, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. You keep adding straws until one of them breaks the camel. They're, they're putting such a load, such a burden on people with these rules you can imagine, rather than worshiping God, they go and try to watch out that they don't break the least infraction. Legalism. We talked about this. So here you see how these men viewed the Sabbath and wanted everyone else to see it that way. So in their mind, man was made to observe the Sabbath. That's the reason he was here. And if he broke this, he was guilty of a criminal act. Now that's in the mind of the scribes and the Pharisees. They did not care if their view was correct. They only wanted to sue their own guilty consciences. So you see, we can make our see ourselves feel less guilty if we're given something to do to atone for our sin. Look at the cults. That's what they do. You must do this and this and the other in order to please God, to find acceptance with Him. You have to do this. You have to be here. Or you have to be in a certain place at a certain time. That's human nature. But that is not the gospel way. They give you something to do to atone for your sin. But Jesus forgives sin when we are drawn to the Father. And I pray you have been drawn to the Father through His Spirit. So let's consider these words in this text before us. And I pray we will be drawn. Concepts in this text that will encourage us to make the Christian Sabbath or Sunday a day of doing good rather than bad or evil. The first concept is notice the scene of this miracle, where it happens. You see that in the first verse, the very first part. Jesus returns to the synagogue. As a matter of fact, it is a synagogue, not the synagogue, because there were many of those scattered throughout Israel, but it was obviously somewhere in the area where he has been ministering. And remember, he has run into tradition before when he was in the synagogue. And when tradition runs into need, one or the other needs to be disregarded. It was Jesus' custom to attend services at a synagogue. Is it your custom to attend worship? Do your neighbors know where you will be on Sunday morning? Do your children or your grandchildren ask if you're going to church? It should never be a question where you will be on Sunday. It should never. It should never be a question whether worship is important. Too many people do not realize how important it is. And we will talk about that in our time together today a little bit. Remember what Jesus said, man cannot live by bread, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you do not make worship a priority, many are starving spiritually and they don't even know. But you see, what we don't see is where the Pharisees sat in the synagogue. They sat on the very front row. They had to observe the scene. They pretended it was important. They didn't come to worship as the others did. They came for one reason, and that was to catch Jesus doing something against their traditions. 
And we've already read the text, so you know they're not going to be disappointed. A man was there who had a withered hand. Tells us, as I mentioned, that he was not born that way. It was some kind of accident or illness that came upon him to make him that way. One of the Gnostic gospels, the gospel to the Hebrews, says that this man was a that mean he used a hammer in one hand and a chisel in the other. So, he couldn't do that. That was how he made his living. Stone cutters make their living with their hands. He could not make a living unless he began to beg. You ask, well, why was this man in the synagogue? That's a good question. And I think it begs answering. Why? He has a problem. Is that where you go when you have a problem? He needed to hear from God. And folks, when we come to worship, we ought to come expect. He needed to know what to do. Obviously, his family, if he had a wife and children, and probably did, he needed to know what to do. How am I going to take care of them? There was no welfare system like we have today. And you can tell probably from the desperation of how Mark writes this down that he did not know where else to go. Now let me ask you this while we're thinking about why he was there in the synagogue. Why do you come to worship? To inquire of the Lord? inquire of the Lord. Lord, I need to know what to do. Or to find out His will. Maybe there's several decisions you have to make to hear from Him. You see, it is possible to meet with Jesus other than church. But it is not like when you come to church what are you expecting? Do you come expecting God to do something extraordinary or do you come expecting to see the same thing every week? Because you see, the scripture is not silent about this. When two or three gather in his name, the scripture says he will be in their midst. And I think the key phrase there is gathering in his name. Ask me, Brother Keith, does God still, do you believe God still performs miracles? Yes, I do. If it suits his purpose or purposes. And no, if it does not suit his purpose. That is why many people get sick, get heart disease or some other ailment, and after a time they leave this earth. There's a sickness unto death. There's a sickness to the glory of God and there's a sickness unto healing. That's the scriptural view. And if we look at this like what was this man's ailment? What was the reason behind this? Pretty evident to the glory of God. But let's move on. That's the person who received this miracle. But number three, notice the dispute that arose from the miracle. And that's in verses 2 to 4. You see, the Pharisees came for one reason. When they knew that Jesus was going to be there, they wanted to be there also. Not because of Him, but so they could find fault with what He did. Oh my goodness. That's a preaching point right there. Why do you come to church? To see what so-and-so is wearing? Or not? Or do you come trying to find something wrong? Because I promise you, if you look for the negative, you will usually find it. And the Pharisees were looking to find fault with Jesus. They were looking for Jesus to go against their rules. It did not matter if they were wrong. No one was supposed to meddle 
with their little thing they had going on. And there's so much involved in this. If you remember when Jesus was in the temple that day and people were dropping their money into the, wasn't an offering plate, it was probably a jar. And that lady came and she put just a few coins in there and it was Jesus got very excited, called his men over there. You see her? Yeah. We, she put more than everybody else combined. Well, how could that be? She looks like a very poor person. Well, she is but she gave everything she had. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees had this system set up so that especially in holy days of the year when people came to the temple to bring their offerings, you had to change your pagan money, Roman money, into temple money. That's why they were called money changers. They did that and they charged you for it. Isn't that nice? Don't you like it when a Christian ministry wants to charge you for everything? That's not the way of Scripture. No one was supposed to meddle with the system they had set up. And Jesus came and did just that. Consider what Jesus said. It's very important to see this. Because you see, He knew what was in their hearts and he called the man to the front. This is probably the first time that anyone's ever been called down to the front of a worship service. Why did he do that? Why did he call him to the front? Probably so that people could see his situation. He has a bad hand. He cannot use it. But he also wanted them to think scripturally about what was going to happen. And he confronted the Pharisees with two separate questions. Number one, is it lawful? Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? That's a good question. Because you see, this man could have waited till the next day. We know that. Jesus could have said, hey, if you'll be here tomorrow, Sunday, I'll heal that hand. But we don't want to mess with this little system that the crowd and the Pharisees got. He didn't do that, did he? No. He could have waited, and Jesus could have waited till the next day. And by this, he would have avoided this whole confrontation with the Pharisees. But as the scripture is very clear to tell us, he did not. And that is a good question for us today. What do we do on the Sunday? The Christian Sabbath. That is good. Considered good. What do we do on the Lord's Day? We talked about this last week. Worship, of course. We should do that. But as Scripture makes it very clear, the this day of the week is a day of rest. It's a day of reflection. It's a day of reform. It's a day of rejoicing. We talked about that last week. But what is it that we might do on Sunday, the Christian Sabbath, that would be considered bad or evil? Have you thought about that? Well, one thing is to not worship. That would be considered bad. You say, why is that? Why do we have to worship God? Because He deserves it. Everything he has ever done, all of his creation looks to him. To refrain from worship, to not give him what is rightfully his, is stealing. One of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? But what is something else that we can easily do on Sunday, the Lord's Day, that might be considered bad or evil? Well, I talked about this a little bit last week. Worshipping the creation rather than the creator. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't have a problem with people going on vacation. Our family does that every year. There's nothing wrong with that. But to 
go to the beach or the river or the lake instead of worship and to make a practice of that is definitely bad. Or the golf course. I read an interesting plaque one time and it was like a woman had written this and she said, when I die, bury me at the golf course so my husband will visit me five days a week. There you have it. I don't have anything against golf. I don't see the sense in it, but I don't have anything against it. I had an uncle that was very avid. I have several sons, but both of my sons like to play golf. I don't see the sense in having the ball and then knocking it as far as you can and going after it. I'd just as soon keep it myself. And then the second question Jesus asked, is it good to save life or to kill? That's a good question too, isn't it? Because you see, the Pharisees were content to let this man starve or to turn to a life of begging. You know, Jesus was looking down the road. These men were not. Not only was this man's life saved, but the life of his family. But we're not finished. Number four, notice the manner in which this miracle was performed. You know what's really interesting about this? Notice what the text says. Now, maybe you've never paid any attention to this before. Verse 5, and when he had looked around at them with anger, Jesus Christ got angry with these men. How many times do we see him get angry? Not very many. But this is one of those times. These men were men of hard hearts. Jesus was thinking of saving this man's life they were thinking of finding a way to kill Jesus. But that did not stop the Lord of glory, did it? He told the man, stretch out your hand. Now think about this. He couldn't do that. But he did. This was something that he could not do before Jesus told him to do it. And yet when he told the man to do something he could not do, he did it. Probably know where I'm going with this. This is another picture of the command to be saved. I can't. I don't have it in me. I certainly can't save myself. I will not turn to God unless he first comes to me. In Acts 17 verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. It is not a suggestion for you and me to be saved, folks. It is a command. A command. All men are commanded to repent. Yet, the, the problem with that is we can't. You say, well, then why would you even waste your time preaching? Because when the call comes, and we've talked about this, when the call comes, it brings with it the ability to believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That is why we tell men and women, boys and girls, you must repent. Because let me ask you something. Do you know of anyone who wants to do that? <laughs> I don't. In all my life, I have never met someone who was just dying to repent. As a matter of fact, it was only after understanding the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ and their sinfulness that they even thought about repenting. You see, when we look at Jesus and His pure holiness, and we compare that to our sinful wretchedness, then we want to repent and believe the gospel. Because the question comes to mind, why do men not want to repent 
and believe the gospel? It's a simple question, a very simple answer. Because just like the Pharisees, they have hard hearts. And you and I will never shatter that hard heart. The Holy Spirit of God can and does. As a matter of fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, men suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. But back to the text, when the man did something that he was asked to do, which physically he was not able to do, he was healed immediately. Just like that. And everybody in that audience there today saw it. Can you imagine that withered hand would have been, well, the word in the original means to be dried up. So it was probably shriveled. We don't know if it was his right or left. Either way, he couldn't be a stone cutter if that's actually what he did. But the point that I'm making is when you do what Jesus commands, you will be saved. If you repent and believe the gospel, you will be saved. But then in verse 6, we come to number 5. Notice the results of this miracle. This is pretty interesting, folks. This shows you how far men will go to destroy the Christian religion. It has been under attack from the very beginning. The Bible has been under attack. It is still under attack. People disregard it today because we have become civilized and we know more than God, or we think we do. Notice the results of this miracle in verse 6. The Pharisees went out and joined with the Herodians to destroy Jesus. Now, who are the Herodians? They were people who attended to King Herod. They rubbed shoulders every day with the Romans, and the Pharisees, under normal conditions, would have considered those men unclean. But not if it meant joining with them to destroy Jesus Christ. They were willing to overlook their own bias to destroy Jesus Christ. Are you like those Pharisees? I hope not. You base your salvation on what happens on the outside. Church attendance. Bible reading. Prayer before meals. But there is no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, the devil can do all of those things. Matter of fact, I think most of the time he's in church when we get there. If not, sometimes we bring him with us. Rather than a personal relationship with Christ. You see, when we look at scripture, it is not what you do that counts. You say, well, what is it? It's who you know. It's who you know. And folks, I'll tell you, even as a Christian for years, I struggled with this. I would set aside a time every day to read the Bible and pray. And sometimes I had to force myself to do that. Maybe you can understand that. Maybe you have been there. Sometimes I had to force myself to do that. And then I came to realize Jesus wants more than 10 or 15 minutes a day. Having a relationship with four hours a day, seven days a week transaction. That's what it is. I'm not saying don't spend time with him. But let's stop putting him in a box because I'll find you will find out as I did. You put God in a box. He won't stay there. He's too big. So let me ask you, according to this passage and what we've talked about, what are you doing on the Lord's day to either save life or to do good? Yes, it is good to spend time with family. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But are you doing the very best thing when you do something other than worship the creator and savior of all the belief. Because the bottom line is oftentimes when we do that, we're 
we're trying to work our way to heaven. And God tells us in his word that it's not by works of the flesh, but by grace through faith that anyone will ever be saved. You have heard the saying, probably, don't just stand there, do something. That's the message of the cults. Don't just stand there, do something. Go and do this. Go and do the other. You need to be here. You need to do this, do that, do the other. But what's the message of Christianity? Don't just do something. Stand there. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Let the grace of God wash over you and help you to see that it's not by keeping rules or laws or commandments that we are saved. Cults tell you that in order to be saved, you've got to do this, that, or the other. Jesus said there's two things you have to do, and you can only do those when you are born again, and that is believe and repent. That's it. If you do that, Keith is not telling you that you'll be saved. The Word of God is telling you that. And I pray you will before it was too, it's too late. So what can we learn just in a short, brief statement from this passage of Scripture? He said it when we ended our time last week. The, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It's his day. And I got a phone call this week from a good friend who said, I'm so glad to hear what you had to say. That way I know that I can go fishing on Sunday. And I said, no, 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 that is not what I said. But I am saying that that's not going to keep you out of heaven. But you better not make a practice of doing anything other Bottom line is when when we do what we do on Sunday, is it for good or for evil? Think about that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for Jesus that brings this to our attention. Lord, we might have read over this passage before and thought, you know, I'd like to have been there and, and saw how all of this happened. But Father, there's so much that lies beneath the surface to help us see that even in today, in 2020, it's real easy for us not to do good on Sunday. Yes, there's a fine line between making a practice of something and just doing it once. But the what we need to understand as followers of Christ, and Father, you make this very clear in your word, is that we need to make a practice of worship. We need to make a practice of observing what you say in your word. We need to make a practice of following your son just as close to him as we can get. And the only way we can do that, Father, is by knowing who you are and who he is. And that is only through reading and studying your word. Help us do that. I pray, Father, we will never look at Sunday the same again. Bless your people. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We will see you next Sunday.